going to talk about vision in early childhood. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I hope to give you some information today about children's vision, how vision develops in children, um, how it guides development of other skills, and also what the common types of vision problems children encounter are, things to look for in early childhood. Um, also an overview. You can't hear me. Okay, I don't think you can do it for some of that unless you choose. Okay, hopefully this is a bit better. I'll try and talk louder then. <laughs> <laughs> so, another thing I'll try and include today is, a, is kind of a presentation of how we test vision in children. So you're all probably very familiar with how your own eyes are tested, and you're all probably thinking that a young child could never go through the same protocol. And so I'll show you what the protocol is for young children, and how children of any age really can have their eyes tested comprehensively so that we can identify vision problems. So I do want to tell you that the slides will be available um, to best start, and so I understand they'll be put on the website or, or made available to you in some way, so you don't have to write everything down. Um, and if not, you can always contact me. I'm happy to share the slides with you as well. So um, if there are questions throughout the course of the presentation, please feel free to ask me at any time, but we'll also have time at the end for questions. So. First, um, vision is a, a very dominant sense. So we say that as kids develop in early childhood, 80% of what they learn comes through visual input. So they use their vision to take in information from the environment that guides their development. And 80% of their development is dependent on vision. So it's a very dominant and important skill. Um, sometimes it's assumed that children see well. Um, and different um, observations, behavioral observations, um, are not always attributed to vision problems. Sometimes they're <coughs> suspected of being indicative of other uh, problems with development when in fact they're vision related. So from a very young age, vision is an important sense to, con to consider um, and to look at and evaluate. Vision is, affects every aspect of a child's development. So gross and fine motor skills are dependent on vision in that um, you need clear vision and accurate visual aiming of the two eyes in order to guide eye and hand movements and fine motor skills. Um, even with gross motor development, with going up and down stairs, um, with walking across uh, flooring that may change in slope or elevation or color, vision guides those motor movements as well. Um, in terms of development of language skills, um, children look at facial expressions, lip movement, and such um, to learn the meaning of phrases that they hear. So they're visual clues that augment the auditory input. And so vision is influencing the development of language skills as well. Children learn their social skills, many of their social skills, through imitation and repetition. And of course, they need to be able to see what other kids and other people are doing in order to model their own behavior and learning after that. So um, how they interact with people um, sometimes is a reflection of how comfortable they are with viewing uh, both the details of people that they're interacting with and the details of the environment as a whole. When kids get closer to school age, so preschool and then throughout the school age years, vision is an important aspect of their learning achievements. So reading a book depends largely on vision, not only clarity of vision, but the ability to sustain focus throughout a, uh, throughout a period of, of reading. Um, also being able to track and making accurate eye movements so that the eyes can track the words on a page and keep your place as you're reading, not skip lines or words. Um, copying from the blackboard involves a lot of visual skills, being able to see clearly at distance, being able to see clearly at near, being able to re-coordinate your eyes, find the spot where you are on the blackboard, find the spot where you are on the page. So eye aiming and teaming skills 
It also involves a lot of visual memory. You have to remember what you saw on the blackboard so that when you switch your gaze to up close, you can remember what it is you're supposed to write. And then you need your eye-hand coordination skills to actually guide the motor movements to writing things down on the page. So it's a very complex visual task, just copying from the blackboard. Um, many gym activities and recreational activities depend on depth perception and gross motor coordination, which also is guided through vision. So vision skills develop very rapidly in children, and within the first year, all of the major visual skills should be fully developed. So this means that vision is in place from a very early age to then guide the rest of development. And it also means that we should be expecting vision to be normal at a young age and not expecting kids to outgrow or we shouldn't be waiting and seeing what happens with vision because most things are set within the first year. I'll explain all of these terms in more detail with more examples as we go through. Eye movements is pretty easy to understand, but this is tracking and fixation and following as, as things move in the environment. Accommodation is the focusing system, being able to see clearly close and then far and at different distances. Contrast sensitivity is being able to see, you know, the differences in contrast between bright and dark and different shades of color, pastels versus bright vivid colors. Color vision, being able to see and discriminate colors. Stereopsis is depth perception. Visual acuity is the clarity of vision or the smallest detail that can be seen clearly. And refractive error is what we commonly know as the prescription. So the prescription for glasses, the amount of nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism that may cause the eye to see things out of focus and that can be corrected with glasses. Um, you see there that refractive error is set by 12 months. So this means that at birth, children don't always have accurate focusing. The different components of the eye may be such that the eye is a bit nearsighted or farsighted. Over the first year of life, the growth of the eye is very interactive with the focus of the eye. And so over the course of the first year, large and erratic refractive errors tend to minimize and correct themselves. And really within the age of nine to 12 months, we have a good indication of whether a child is going to have a significant refractive error that persists. So honestly, we consider prescribing glasses for them at this age. How to assess color vision in a three and four yeah, month old child? Only, unfortunately, only through behavioral uh, indicators. So um, working with different targets that may have different colors and watching a child's reaction. But you're right, there are no standardized tests for color vision. There are some research methods that have been used, but they're not in clinical practice. And they're based on a, a preferential looking uh, paradigm, which you'll see in visual acuity as well. We have clinical tests for visual acuity based on that protocol, but we don't have anything in color vision just yet that we use clinically. So clinically, I would say the youngest that we can assess color vision reliably would be, depending on the cooperation of the child, would be maybe two, two at the very youngest, two and a half to three reliably. So when does the color of the eye kind of finalize and change? I would say it changes the increase in pigment in the iris, which uh, changes the color of the eye from blue or, or light brown at birth to a darker color, um, usually is within six months and sometimes up to a year. So beyond a year, it's not likely to change very much. The first step in assessing vision, I think, is assessing risk factors for vision. And especially in young children, I think this guides clinical practice more than anything. These are the most important factors for identifying which kids need to have their vision tested as soon as possible or at as young an age as possible. 
So risk factors include all of the things listed here. Prenatal infections include things like toxoplasmosis, CMV, rubella, syphilis, all of which can have devastating complications in the eyes, usually retinal, uh, retinal dystrophies or retinal scarring and such, which can permanently affect a vision as well as other senses. Many of these kids also have hearing loss, um, and some will have a cognitive impairment. Um, but vision is usually is very highly affected in these conditions. Um, trauma, obviously. Other toxins that uh, maybe that the fetus may be exposed to in pregnancy also can have an effect on eyes. Smoking is one of the, the um, highest toxins or what it linked most strongly with the development of strabismus, which is a misalignment of the eyes. Um, and of course, alcohol, we all know that, that eye problems are a component of fetal alcohol spectrum <coughs> with obviously, or with often underdevelopment of the optic nerve. Strabismus as well, which is a misalignment of the eyes and often some characteristic changes in the shape of the eye and the spacing of the two eyes. Premature birth is another big risk factor for vision problems. So in the immediate uh, perinatal period, kids who are born probably less than 36 weeks are screened for retinopathy of prematurity, which uh, results from an underdevelopment of the retina and the retinal blood vessels, which is common in kids under 36 weeks, um, and sometimes can lead to retinal scarring and retinal detachment and even blindness. But even kids who recover from ROP or retinopathy of prematurity, or even premature kids who never had ROP, also are at a much higher risk for other vision problems. They tend to have a much higher incidence of refractive errors, meaning prescription for glasses. Um, they have a higher incidence of strabismus, misalignment of the eyes. And well into adolescence, they have a higher incidence of visual processing problems. These are things like visual memory, spatial perception, um, figure ground discrimination. So these kids benefit from having early visual assessments and continued visual assessments throughout childhood and adolescence. How early? How early? We're going to get to that later, but I'm going to tell you best recommendation is six months, six to 12 months for the first exam. So. Complications uh, during delivery, long labor, assisted instrument assisted delivery, um, oxygen deprivation or anoxia in the perinatal period um, obviously gives a risk for um, brain development and as such an effect on the eyes as well. So when we get down to certain conditions, cerebral palsy, which often is uh, associated with uh, labor, labor and delivery complications, also has a very high incidence of eye problems. Childhood illnesses, viral diseases, high fever also tend to increase the incidence of vision problems. Many kids will have the onset of an eye turn after a, a long and severe viral infection or high fever. Um, and we see that frequently where kids come in where a new problem is noticed after a child has suffered a prolonged illness. Developmental and genetic syndromes have a very high association with vision problems. So Down syndrome, for instance, 90% of, of kids with Down syndrome will have eye complications of, of one in one area or another. Um, even kids with um, uh, Fragile X syndrome have uh, learning problems as well as some characteristic vision problems. Um, these are well documented and well known, so it's it's useful to know the, the um, health history of a child and their developmental history when assessing their vision. So the sharing of information between developmental pediatricians and optometrists or other eye doctors, um, as well as public health professionals and family doctors, that sharing of information is useful because it's a little bit in terms of checking for the eyes, especially with a young child where the assessment may be limited. It's useful to know the kinds of things that the child is most likely to have and to look for those things things first. And so knowing the history and the child's risk factors helps to make it a more targeted exam. Still comprehensive, but targeted in the areas that are most important. Um, we talked about cerebral palsy, hearing impairment. So obviously children with hearing impairment rely so much more on their vision. Um, and they also have a higher incidence of, of problems. Uh, certain causes of hearing impairments, congenital CMV infection, has eye complications. Charge syndrome has quite severe eye complications. And so um, maximizing vision to its greatest degree obviously helps that child have maximum input from all their senses. 
And then family history. So many eye conditions like high refractive error, strabismus, amblyopia, we'll talk about those terms as we go, many of them have a, gen a very strong genetic component. So when there's a family history of problems, an early eye exam is a very important thing. So visual milestones. I won't read through all of these for you, but you can see there are very discrete things that can be recognized in terms of visual development at every age, even starting, you know, in the first month of life. And so it, while many of these things, you know, are part of normal development, we sometimes don't think of them as specifically vision related. And so again, looking at these things as vision related can help to identify vision problems at an early age. I'm gonna go through these. I'll let you read them. You can see here that starting between 18 months and two years of age, we get more into the eye-hand coordination activity. So kids are starting to scribble and print and color. And this is where we see more of a link with their pre preschool learning skills um, and the impact that vision has on those. And when we get into the real preschool years, three to five, um, we're looking more specifically at how accurately they can draw and print and recognize letters. And these are reflections of both the clarity and the physical aspects of the clarity of their vision as well as visual processing. <coughs> So how common are vision problems in children? Pretty common. Of preschoolers, at least 10% have vision problems that need attention and correction. Um, that increases to 25% when we're in the school age, age range. There's a much higher prevalence in children who are at risk, and this goes back to our risk factors and why it's so important to understand what those risk factors are and to make sure kids are, are having eye exams to identify types of vision problems. So Aboriginal kids have a very high incidence of vision problems, um, mainly refractive errors, so they tend to have a lot of astigmatism, high astigmatism, refractive errors. And so over 30% of them at school age require glasses or spectacle correction to improve and see their vision and see clearly. 40% of deaf kids have eye problems, up to 75% of kids with cerebral palsy, kids with a global developmental delay, also 50 to 80% of them, and of course Down syndrome with one of the highest incidences of, of vision problems. So first little quiz. Children with vision problems may have speech delays, may crawl or walk late, may have difficulty interacting with others, and may have a short attention span for their age. Any guesses? Any, all of the above. The reason I've chosen these is that, and I'll bring up another slide, it might even be next, of very obvious eye-related signs and symptoms of vision problems. But I think these signs and symptoms are easily attributed to other things. So many parents tell me, you know, that their child, you know, has a short attention span to do a particular task. So no, my three-year-old doesn't like to color or look at books. He just doesn't like that. That's not his, you know, that's his personality. He just doesn't like to do that. Um, and they don't really, they don't really look further to see if there's an underlying reason for that. And certainly, if vision isn't clear, if there's a strain in vision, um, if there's double vision because the eyes aren't aligning together, that makes it very uncomfortable to sit and do a task where you're asked to look at a word or a letter and they're so close together that they appear to be doubling over top of each other. And so, of course, your child doesn't like to do that activity because it's very uncomfortable visually. So we have to look past behavior and personality to recognize that these can be signs of vision problems. Here are some more concrete signs of vision problems that obviously are to do with the eye itself. So in, in early you know, infancy, a white pupil. So even family doctors from day one will do a red reflex test shining a light into the eye to see the reflection, the red reflex back. And that red reflex is a reflection off the retina, which is that reddy, orangey color. And if there's any opacity or blockage of light, meaning primarily a cataract in young children, then that red reflex won't be uh, bright and it won't be um, complete, so there'll be gaps in it or dark spots in it. So um, some parents themselves will notice a white pupil, either when they take a picture of their child um, or when they look at their child. 
When a pupil is white in a picture, it can be a lot of different things. It always warrants follow-up and investigation. It could be due to a cataract that's blocking the red reflex. It could also be due to a misalignment of the eye because the light is reflecting from one eye from a different angle than from the other. And it can also be due to a difference in refractive error between the two eyes. If one eye is extremely nearsighted and the other eye is not, then the reflection of light back out through the eye in response to a camera flash will be different. So one reflex may look more dull or less bright than the other. So any difference in the red reflex, specifically you know, the extreme being a white pupil, warrants investigation at an early age. A droopy eyelid is also a concern, especially in early infancy. If it's so droopy to block the pupil and block the vision, that can interfere with the development of vision. Eyes misaligned is called strabismus, so if one eye is turned in or turned out, that eye also will lag in its visual development because it's not receiving focused stimulation or a vision, focused vision. Constant eye movement is a, a description of a term called nystagmus, where the eyes vibrate. And this is sometimes a motor muscle or a neurological issue, but warrants you know, very prompt investigation at a young age. As kids get older, sometimes they'll squint their eyes or tilt their head to one side. I know kids, um, infants and, and toddlers that I see who often have a, a high prescription, meaning a high degree of farsightedness or nearsightedness, often will do this tipping their head down and looking like this. And some parents interpret that as, a, as an endearing kind of expression that their child has when in fact it's a response to focus their eyes better. Some kids will actually close or cover one eye if they sense that that eye is giving them you know, um, unfocused or disturbing visual information. They'll actually learn at an early age that it's easier to cover that eye. More often though, they'll turn their head so completely that that eye is blocked off by the nose. Some kids will rub their eyes, some kids are very sensitive to light. And there are a few conditions that are associated with sensitivity to light, um, but as a rule, kids tend to be more sensitive to light than adults. Um, watery eyes, frequent eye infections, some kids are more prone to this. Kids with Down syndrome are more prone to a chronic kind of inflammation of their eyelids and frequent eye infections. And then just failure to reach visual and developmental milestones. So knowing what to expect from vision at different stages of childhood and knowing whether or not a child is meeting those milestones is a good indication of, of whether there are signs of vision problems. As kids get older, we look more at their ability to do certain tasks to judge if their eyes are, are working properly. So puzzles, building blocks, learning recognizing letters and numbers, when they're printing, keeping a consistent size and space between their letters, being able to stay on the line, um, writing their letters in the correct orientation and not backwards, um, keeping their place when they read, not skipping words or lines, copying from the blackboard. Um, kids with vision problems often have a lot more, require a lot more effort or have more difficulty doing written work, getting their work down on paper. So they'll answer much more quickly or be much more efficient if they can give a verbal answer to something, but to get that work down on paper requires a lot more effort because their eyes are working harder. And then sometimes kids will actually complain of blurred vision or double vision or headaches. But I'd say that it's not until about age 12 that kids have the self-awareness skills that are necessary to really self-identify with these things. I'm always surprised when a four-year-old tells me that he or she has double vision. So that's an advanced level of self-awareness. So, so we think, we think that kids, you know, they experience things, but they don't always know how to express them. They don't know the words that describe those, but they also think that everybody else sees that way, so they don't think it's remarkable enough to tell anybody about because they've never had a different experience, so they just assume that's the way things look. Sometimes when you ask them, and they'll say, yeah, I see that. You know, do you see double? Yeah, I see two of things sometimes. And it's always a shock to the parents in the room that their child has reported this because they A, never thought to ask, and the child never thought to mention it to anyone before. So when vision problems go undetected, kids struggle a lot more with using their vision for different tasks. So they may, you know, again, not participate in class as much. They may have poor problem-solving abilities. 
concentration and behavior issues are a key sign and difficulties working through conflicts. So staying with a task long enough to arrive at a solution to it. As time goes on, you know, studies in adolescence show that there's a higher dropout rate amongst kids. You know, there's a higher incidence of vision problems in kids who drop out of school or who become young offenders. Um, and kids often by, you know, an older age when they've lived with visual you know, visual problems and the increased effort that's required to get work done, they often have a, a you know, a negative image of themselves or they feel like they can't do things um, or by that time they've lost motivation to continue to try to do things. So with kids who have reading difficulties, what percentage do you think have uncorrected or unidentified vision problems? the highest, 60%. So, a distinction between eyesight and vision. So, when I ask people, how's your vision? Most people think, oh, I can see fine. And they think that's all there is to their vision. So eyesight is really that. It's the ability to see a particular size of detail at a particular distance clearly. And in our terminology, 2020, which we all consider as normal vision, really means that from 20 feet, you can see a letter that's one centimeter in height. So that's 2020 vision. So if you can see that, you have 2020 vision or 2020 eyesight. But vision isn't all about just what's the smallest detail you can see. Vision involves a lot of things. So it's can you see it comfortably? Do both eyes look at that target at the same time? Do both eyes see it at that level? Can you focus on an equivalent target, you know, from 20 feet to 10 feet to 5 feet to 40, you know, 40 centimeters to 10 centimeters where you need it to read? Um, you know, can your eyes move in sync? and smoothly, do they stay aligned with the target when they're moving? Can they move quickly and accurately so that you can, your eyes can jump from one target to another without a delay in focusing between? Are your eyes healthy inside? Um, and can you process what you're seeing? So can you relate what you see with other experiences from the past? Can you recognize the difference between a B and a D, which are similar shapes but just different in their spatial orientation? And all of these other things comprise vision. Just a quick lesson in the components of the eye, because when I show you some slides later on, I may refer to some of these components of the eye. So the front part of the eye, the clear surface of the eye, is the cornea. The colored part of the eye is the iris. The pupil is the black hole in the center of the iris. Conjunctiva is the white part of the eye. Vitreous is just a clear gel that's inside the eye. You don't really see that. The choroid and the retina are the lining of light-sensitive cells at the back of the eye. And the optic nerve is the bundle of nerve fibers that takes all the visual stimulation from inside the eye and takes it back to the brain for cortical interpretation. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the common types of problems in children. So nearsightedness, or myopia, is a condition where the eyeball is a little longer than average, and images focus in front of the retina. So the image on the retina is blurred. So nearsighted kids see things clearly up close, but have blurred vision when they look far away. So these are kids that are always moving closer to the blackboard or the TV, or holding things closer in their hands. Um, these are kids that may have more difficulty with sporting events that involve distance vision. So baseball where you need to be able to see a small ball coming towards you and to judge the speed and the distance of it. Um, even you know activities like running or riding a bike because you need to be able to see where you're going effectively. Farsightedness is kind of the opposite problem. The eyeball is too short and images focus behind the retina. Um, 
In adults, it's pretty easy to understand farsightedness. You see well far, but you have trouble focusing on things up close. And kids don't follow that pattern, so they fool us. They typically see well at all distances because they're using their focusing muscles to bring the focus of objects behind the retina up in front onto the retina. So they're working hard to focus on things, but they can still see. So their eyesight is good, but the comfort of their vision is strained. So the types of signs and symptoms we see with farsightedness are more frustration, inattention, headache um, type signs. So kids may feel frustrated, particularly with close tasks. They may become fatigued or inattentive after very short periods of time of trying to concentrate on close vision tasks. And that can involve reading, computer, crafts, anything that has small details and requires visual discrimination at a close distance. Sometimes farsightedness causes so much strain in the focusing system that the eyes start to cross in response to that strain. And that's one of the key signs of high farsightedness in children is an eye that wanders in. So when they focus on something, when they hold something in front of them to look at it, one eye will turn in. And when they relax their vision to look at distance on a kind of a non-focused target, then their eyes will straighten back out again. And that starts at about age, between ages two and five. So that's one of the key key signs that brings people, it brings kids in for an eye exam. Astigmatism is really just another error in the focusing of the eye. Harder to understand, it's centered at the front surface of the eye. So the cornea, the clear surface at the front of the eye, has an oval shape like a football instead of a baseball. And so the type of blur that occurs with astigmatism is at all distances, both far and near, but it's an uneven blur. So it's not like the whole target is blurred like you see in the corner under compromise. It's either, you know, horizontal defocus, or this, in this case, this is a horizontal focus and a vertical defocus. So you can see the vertical aspect of the letters is out of focus. And in this situation, the horizontal aspect of the letters is out of focus. So when letters are your target, some letters are easier to recognize than others. So if it's a, you know, if it's a um, vertically oriented letter versus a horizontally oriented letter, it may be easier or harder to recognize. So everything's out of focus at all distances, but the shape of what you're looking at depends on how badly so. And um, people with astigmatism tend to be able to identify some of the key features in details. When they read a line of letters on the eye chart, they typically will get three out of five of them correct, you know, on every row. <laughs> because, because of the nature of the blur with astigmatism, it's an uneven kind of blur. Beyond just how, you know, how the eye is focused, we look at how the eyes coordinate together. So eye teaming is really eye alignment. So are the eyes straight? Do they point in the exact same direction? And when they don't, that's called strabismus. Um, eyes that are perfectly straight, though, that do point in the same direction, also can have trouble coordinating together. So focusing or accommodation, again, is the ability to readjust the focus as objects move at different distances. And so this can result in blurry vision when things come closer towards you. Or after you've been reading or looking at something up close for a while and you look out at something across the room, there's, things are blurred for a few seconds until the eyes refocus. Motility is the movement of the eyes, so how smoothly and accurately do they move? They might be aligned, but are they moving accurately? So can they make the short movements that are required in reading? Can they jump back to the beginning of the next line accurately? Um, and can they converge, meaning turning in, or diverge, turning out, depending on where the target is situated that they're looking at? So here's pictures of strabismus. Esotropy is when the eye turns in. And so in the top picture, it's very obvious that the left eye is turning in. In the lower picture, it's not so obvious. It looks like the right eye is turning in. But in infants, one, one very complicating factor is the presence of the eyelid folds, the epicanthal folds. And depending on the development of the shape of the, the eyelids themselves, they often will hide the inner aspect of the eye. And so sometimes it looks like one eye is, is closer to the center or turned in when in fact the eyes are straight, but the, the epicanthal folds are asymmetric. So 
In this case, we judge by looking at the light reflex from the eye and also doing a test called cover test, where when you look at a target, you cover one eye, and then you look, you cover the other eye, and then you look. And typically, if the eyes aren't both focused at the target, one of them will move when you cover the other one. So, Exotropia is when the eye turns out, like you see here. Exotropia tends not to be constant. So exotropia tends to come and go. When the child is tired, the eye starts to drift out. When they're inattentive, when they're just sitting and daydreaming, the eye tends to turn out. And as soon as you draw their attention, their focus, and their alertness to something, they snap back into place again. So it comes and goes. And sometimes it's, um, you know, sometimes it's only at the end of the day. Sometimes it's only after they wake up from a nap. Um, and it can be harder to establish the, you know, the frequency or the consistency of how often it's happening. Visual efficiency skills, like I said before, they're not obvious to look at the child. The eyes look aligned, so there's no way to observe that they're not, that the eyes aren't focusing or coordinating together properly. Again, we're looking now at behavior issues and, and other symptoms that aren't necessarily recognizable as vision problems. So kids who are clumsy, kids who are frustrated with doing close work, um, kids who aren't, you know, progressing, who aren't able to do their work within a, you know, a reasonably accepted period of time. So it's kids who can't get all their work done in class because of the extra effort that's putting, that they're putting into, new, the extra effort that they're using to focus, which slows them down in their overall progress. Eye health problems. Kids certainly experience eye health problems. We're all much more aware of eye health issues with adults. You know, the development of cataracts and glaucoma and diabetes-related complication. But kids have eye health issues as well. Many of them tend to be more congenital. Um, some of them tend to be, you know, external uh, infection type uh, problems, excessive tearing or blinking, often associated with allergies. Um, Crusty eyes or a discharge from the eyes, often associated with blepharitis, which is an inflammation of the lids. Rubbing, itching eyes, again with allergies. Um, red or swollen eyelids, um, and frequent infection or size. You know, kids touch a lot of things and then they tend to touch their eyes, so they're more at risk for eye infection through contact with various things. And also, you know, in settings like daycares and preschools and, and schools as well, contact with other kids who have eye infections, again through, you know, hand-to-hand -hand contact and then hand-to-eye contact. If, sorry, if it's allergies, like you said, with the rubbing, the itching eyes, is it still an issue, you know, with the causes, or it that my help? It can be an issue. There are some very effective um, eye drops for allergies for kids. So sometimes the blinking and the rubbing is very distracting. And sometimes if they do actually rub, most kids will blink really hard. I hear a lot of complaints of this very pronounced blinking, you know, where it's a really forceful blink. Their eyes really close tightly. Um, but if they rub, then certainly rubbing the eyes can cause an abrasion on the surface of the eye and can cause other damage to the eye. So especially if allergies are recurrent, you know, you, know, you don't really want to let them rub, which can lead to abrasions and other distortions of the eye if they're doing it over long periods of time. So, so if it's distracting, I usually will tell people there's kind of um, conservative ways to manage it, just with artificial teardrops or cool compresses to make the eyes feel better. But if that's not really stopping the behaviors of blinking and rubbing, then it's wise to use an anti-allergy eye drop for a few weeks to control that. And of course, identifying what the source of the allergy is, because then sometimes allergy shots or other approaches to controlling the full allergy. I do see a lot of kids who have allergies in their eyes only without the full allergy picture, without the congestion and, and the other symptoms as well. So those kids are prime candidates for eye drops. And then there are internal eye problems as well, um, often associated with systemic health conditions or the medications that are used for those. So in muscular dystrophy, often treatment is with uh, systemic steroid treatment, and steroids can have devastating complications in the eyes. They can cause glaucoma, cataracts, um, and so it's very common in kids who have muscular dystrophy who are treated with steroids for a number of years to develop cataracts and later require um, cataract surgery and, and management. 
cerebral palsy. Um, again, because one of the one of the main causes of cerebral palsy is lack of oxygen to the brain, because the optic nerve, which travels from the eye to the brain, is connected with that. It often is atrophied in cases or in kids with cerebral palsy. So we'll see, um, you know, a paleness, and I'll show you a picture of that, a paleness to the optic nerve, which results in you know reduced contrast of vision, sometimes in visual field or peripheral vision defects. Diabetes, even in kids these days, many kids uh, with type 2 diabetes at a young age um, are showing eye complications, the diabetic retinopathy that we see in older, in older adults. Some of these, especially eye health related concerns, can exist without any noticeable signs or symptoms, just as they do in adults. And so the only way to really identify these things is through checking. So here's some pictures of eye health issues. So the left picture is just a normal eye. This is a straight on view into the back of the eye. So you're seeing straight on to the optic nerve here, the arteries and veins, and the whole orangey background is the retina. The central part of the retina is the macula. This is the area that we use for clear vision. And then, and central vision. This is all per for peripheral vision. The picture on the left is a coloboma. So a coloboma is an incomplete development of the retina, um, a key feature of CHARGE syndrome, but also occurs on its own without the other features of CHARGE syndrome. This particular coloboma is situated low, lower or inferior to the optic nerve, and so it's not affecting central vision. The central vision area of the retina, the macula here, is intact, and so this child can have normal vision. But because of the presence of the coloboma here, they're missing their whole top field of peripheral vision. This picture is an example of toxoplasmosis infection in the eye. So toxoplasmosis, a congenital toxo infection, has a characteristic involvement of the macula, the central part of vision. So this eye does not see centrally. It's got a big black blind spot centrally, but it has intact peripheral vision. The picture on the left is a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. So this is an inherited eye condition that for some kids develops or has its onset of symptoms and such as early as nine or 10 years of age. And so um, here you see that the scarring and the atrophy of the retina is in, along the outer edges. And so this eye has tunnel vision, no peripheral vision, but central vision. So you can see that referring to the previous slides, you can see that even if a child isn't able to do a visual field test, meaning sitting there and telling me, when can you see the target coming from the side? Even though a child isn't able to do a complex test like that, looking inside their eyes and seeing the, the health of their eye and seeing the anomalies in their eye allows you to understand how their vision is functioning and what effect on vision is, is, um, is manifest. Here are pictures of cataracts. So these are, are um, typical pictures of congenital type cataracts. So the Y suture cataract here is a very common type of congenital cataract. And cataracts, congenital cataracts, um, can occur for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're a result of uh, exposure to toxins. Um, sometimes a result of exposure to infection. Rubella infection in, in utero is a very prime cause of congenital cataracts. Heredity, there are some very um, uh, autosomal dominant heredity, uh, inherited forms of congenital cataract. Depending on the density of the cataract depends on the um, impact on vision so and whether or not cataract surgery is done at an early age. So a cataract like the Y suture cataract may have an effect on vision but because it's only in a discrete area and the other areas of the lens are clear, it may not have a devastating effect on vision. And so surgery may not be done at a young age because of the complications associated with that. Another couple, a uh, picture of a couple common conditions uh, that cause visual impairment. The first is ocular albinism. So albinism is uh, a lack of, it manifests with a lack of pigment in the eye, and so the iris often has, uh, tra is transparent to light, so you can see when you attempt to do the red reflex, you get the red reflex through the iris as well. 
The lower picture is aniridia. So this is an incomplete development of the iris or the colored part of the eye. So essentially, the pupil is the entire size of the eye. This is the only remnant of iris that's here. Another common condition in kids is amblyopia or lazy eye. And this really is um, a failure of vision to develop in one eye or the other. So vision is interrupted or arrested at a certain stage of development because of a causative condition. And the prime causative conditions are a strabismus, where the eye is out of alignment with the other eye. So if one eye is never looking in the same direction as the fixing eye, then the brain will totally ignore that eye and it won't use the visual stimulation from that eye because it's confusing and disparate to the other eye. And with time, that the brain will recognize less and less what that eye is capable of seeing. And amblyopia really is a condition in the brain. It's when the eye-brain connection doesn't develop. Now, another prime cause of amblyopia is when one eye has a high degree of nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism. So it, it might be straight with the other eye, but it's so blurry that again, the brain can't recognize what that eye is capable of seeing. And again, it forms connections only with a strong, straight, clear eye. So there is, and we're gonna go through that. So another cause of uh, amblyopia is a cataract or a droopy eyelid that blocks the vision for one eye. And again, brain is not receiving strong stimulation, or strong images from each eye, so it chooses one eye to form stronger connections with. So most often we say the eye, the amblyopic eye, structurally it's sound, so other than having, you know, if it has a cataract, but other than that, the retina is healthy, opti the optic nerve is healthy, so it's often just an alignment or an optical issue that's causing that eye to, to lay in its development from the other eye. So amblyopia, the most critical period is within the first four years of life. This is when vision develops most rapidly, and this is when you want to identify amblyopia and intervene with, with treatment. So 15,000 three-year-olds, have new three-year-olds, have amblyopia every year in Canada. And unfortunately, we probably only see half of those. So we see the ones whose eye turns because someone recognizes that there's something wrong with the eyes. The other ones, where, the other cases where the eyes stay straight and is just blurry, again, children don't know that both eyes are supposed to have clear vision. And if parents don't notice a difference in the appearance between the two eyes, they're not aware that there's a difference in vision between the two. So what's the leading cause of vision loss in children? Amblyopia. So more than any other cause combined, um, amblyopia causes vision loss and especially is treatable. So it's preventable vision loss. Oh, I forgot I was gonna do that. There we go. So how do we treat vision problems in kids? I would say the most common form is with glasses. So glasses are a treatment for refractive error. There's significant nearsightedness or farsightedness or astigmatism. The first step is to correct that with glasses so that a child has clear vision in both eyes. And then you go from there. Everything else depends on that. So clear vision in both eyes is the first step. Glasses are the most convenient way of doing that, although contact lenses are not contraindicated. So there are some situations where contact lenses are very appropriate <coughs> for kids at young ages, and kids can certainly wear contacts at a young age, even from you know the age of one or two months, kids can wear contacts. So I wouldn't say it's a choice, you know, just as a, you know, I'm tired of wearing glasses, so I want to wear contacts instead at age three. <laughs> But I'd say, you know, for some kids who, say for kids who have autism, who are very tactile sensitive, who won't keep their glasses on their face, once the contact lens is in, it can stay in all day. There are some special situations where you maybe even perhaps can keep the lens in for a month. And so for a very high refractive error in a child who's, you know, spectacle intolerant, there are situations where contacts can be advisable. 
Other times there may be a wild difference in prescription between the two eyes. So you may have one eye that essentially has no prescription and the other has a very high, it requires a very high correction for nearsightedness or farsightedness. So when you get glasses, one lens is nice and thin and the other one is really thick and heavy and the glasses sit kind of lopsided or the child has trouble using that eye because the lens is so thick and causes some distortion because of the thickness of it. And in that situation, a contact lens is beneficial because it's thin, it's light, and it sits right on the eye so the distortions are eliminated and the weight differential is eliminated. So, so it's not the first um, choice option or refractive correction option in kids, but there certainly is a place for contact lens correction in kids. So when we talk again about amblyopia therapy, so the first step is correcting refractive error if there is. The second step is patching. So um, once the, the cause of amblyopia is identified, so is it because the eye is turning in or out? Is it because it's not focused properly? If it's not focused properly, you start with glasses. But the second step is to get that eye working and get proper stimulation and communication between the eye and the brain. And that's what patching does. It eliminates the competition from the other eye. So um, lots of choices for patches. The adhesive kind work well. They can be worn you know, alone or under glasses. Um, there are different cloth patches like you see in the lower picture that, that can attach onto glasses um, that don't you know, have an adhesive that, that irritates the skin or don't put any pressure against the eye. So there's lots of different options to find something that a kid may be tolerant of. Um, there are kids who aren't tolerant of patching um, in any form. And for them, there's the option of eye drop. We call it atropine penalization. So we use the dilating drop in their sound eye, their stronger eye, to dilate their pupil, blur their close vision. And so whenever they do a close, up, a close vision activity, their weaker eye is the only one that's in focus. And so in those situations throughout the day, any close vision situation is training the weaker eye. Distance vision situations, both eyes are working. So the advantages and disadvantages, atropine has a duration of action of three days. So once the drop goes in, that effect is there for three days. So you can't just tape, you can't titrate it like you do with a patch. You can't put the patch on for an hour and then take it off. You have the effect that's set in for that length of time. So that sometimes is the determining factor for, um, for families. Yeah. Both of those things, um, I should say all three of those things, wearing glasses, wearing contact lenses, patching to improve the vision in one eye in cases of amblyopia, all our, our, the strategy behind them is to try and improve and give, give clear vision to each eye. And then the next step is to get those two clearly seeing eyes to work together. So, go ahead. That's a really good question. Up to what age can you do patching? Because there's more and more information on that all the time. So I think we all still agree that the most effective period for patching is probably within the first four to six years. The eye is most responsive to patching during that time. But at what age does the eye become non-responsive to patching? And now the studies are showing us up until at least age 15 or 16 or 17, the eye can still be responsive to patching. And especially in kids who have never had their vision problem identified before and are patching for the first time at say age 13 or 14 or 15 or 16, the eye can still be responsive at that age. So it's well worth at any age. I find even adults who have amblyopia that was never corrected before, if you, if you try to treat the underlying problems, such as correct the refractive error, if they have a big difference in prescription between the two eyes, they may not, they may not be a candidate for doing patching therapy, but they still benefit from the correction because it improves their peripheral vision and sometimes their depth perception as well. Um, they may not still, if you cover the other eye, they may still have a lot of difficulty reading letters on the chart using their central vision, but correcting their refractive error often gives them the other, the spatial correction of vision that's helpful in daily life. So, but for patching well into the teenage years, I'd say is still worthwhile. Okay, so using both eyes together. So this is more um, uh, 
interactive. So this is more like training so or therapy. So this is something a child has to actively participate in. Um, and so this is kids who have, you know, an attention, sufficient attention to work on a task for 10 or 15 minutes a day. Kids who have a cognitive level that they're capable of understanding the task, meaning I recognize that I see two images and I must put them together. And I recognize what it feels like when I converge my eyes or when I diverge my eyes. Or I recognize when something looks blurry and I have to make an adjustment with my eyes. So it's like any other kind of training or exercise program. There's some awareness and commitment um, and maturity that's involved in, in gaining success. But there are computerized programs. There's you know preschool drawing activities um, that can be implemented that can help to teach kids how to use their eyes together better. And this is for this kind of training is for um, visual efficiency skills where the eyes look straight but they're not coordinating together well because of muscle weakness or focusing weakness. So, kids who have an absolute eye turn, a very large strabismus where their eye is turned all the way in or all the way out, vision therapy techniques like this are less effective. So it's only in rare cases that a condition that severe can be corrected just with vision therapy. Sometimes surgery is necessary to physically align the eyes better and then vision therapy afterwards to fine tune that coordination between the two eyes. For kids who have an eye health impairment, so let's say they have a cataract in one eye or they have aniridia, which is an incomplete development of the iris, or they have um, toxoplasmosis, scarring in both eyes so that they don't have clear central vision and nothing you can do with glasses is going to change that because it's a physical impairment of the eye. There are some devices that can use, that can utilize magnification to enhance what vision is remaining. And so even for young kids, um, things like the paperweight magnifiers like you see here, these are easy to use. You just plop them down on the paper and you can see, you can get at least two or three times magnification through them. Um, the other handheld devices, um, some are illuminated. Um, kids need to be a little older to use these, probably six or seven and older. Um, CCTVs can be used at any age, so you put the page underneath the screen and it gives you a magnified view on the screen. And then you can adjust the polarity of it, you can make it black letters on white or black on yellow like you see here, or white on black. You can adjust the level of magnification, and what's nice there is you get like a distortion-free view and you can adjust the level of magnification for it. So for young kids, you can stimulate their interest in books and letters and reading even though they're not able to see the detail in age-appropriate materials. So getting to that point, deciding what uh, treatment is beneficial for kids, uh, I'll give you a distinction between a comprehensive eye exam and a vision screening. So in many areas, um, situations there are vision screenings that are done to try and identify if, if a kid has a vision problem and if they should go on to have an eye exam. And especially in Ontario, I think across Canada, we have a lot of limitations with vision screenings. We don't have any national standards. Um, the U.S. is a little more advanced uh, from us in that, in that they're trying to, they're, they're cognizant of features that make uh, screening protocols more consistent and reliable. But here we have no consistency in the vision screening programs that are administered in places where they are. And so um, sometimes we have trouble drawing conclusions from the vision screening. Vision screenings also always will um, you know, um, identify kids you know, potentially as having a vision problem that really don't, so false positives. Um, and they'll miss some kids that have problems, so false negatives. Um, and depending on the type of screening that's done, up to 43% of kids who have vision problems can fail to be identified by a vision screening protocol. So, um, and especially in the age group under four, where kids are a little less, um, it, it's a, a little more difficult to interpret a child's responses, then it can be especially difficult to understand if, if they're screening positive or negative on a, on a screening. Um, when a child screens, um, 
when the child passes a vision screening, it gives parents a false sense of security, and they don't really understand that you know 30 or 40 percent of kids who have a vision problem could have passed. Their kid could have been one of those 30 or 40 percent that passed the vision screening that still has a vision problem. Um, and the other end of that is that even kids who are identified with a problem still then have to go ahead and have an eye exam, so their parents have to be advised of the result and then take them for an eye exam. And that follow-up sometimes doesn't happen, so some kids don't get the care they need even after they've had a screening. Um, so. A screening also identifies just one, usually does one or two tests, and almost always a visual acuity test, so uh, usually at distance. So usually we're measuring distance eyesight in a screening test, sometimes measuring depth perception as an indication of whether or not the eyes are working. Um, those two tests alone don't comprise a full assessment of vision, and so as such, they're not identifying every problem that could exist with vision. As well with kids, you know, checking their distance vision is not really key to understanding how they use their vision in their daily world because most of the activities they do are up close. And whether or not you have good distance vision doesn't, um, doesn't translate to whether or not you have good near vision. So the two are separate and distinct. So they're not always the same. A comprehensive eye exam involves all of these things and I'll show you how each of these things are done. In history, um, really it's exploration of risk factors. So all the things we talked about earlier are asked about in the case history. So try and identify if a child has a risk factor for a vision problem. As well, you know, we ask about their, if they are in school, how they're progressing with learning skills, whether they're meeting academic milestones as well, um, and whether or not there are any signs or symptoms that the child has expressed up until that time. Um, how do we measure visual acuity? So it's a lot more fun in kids than it is for adults. <laughs> so they don't really get to read the Snellen chart that has the letters. So they get to do a lot more interesting things. Um, I spoke earlier about preferential looking. So these are these um, techniques here where there's stripes on one side of the card but not the other, or a picture on one half of the card and not the other. And here the child just has to identify where the picture is. So they'll point. Sometimes you can tell by their eye gaze which side they're looking at, up or down or side to side. Um, and so behaviorally you can judge just because they're forced to look on one side or the other. As they get older and can identify symbols, we have some very specific symbols that are most reliable with kids. And these are the HOTD symbols and what we call the LEA symbols. These are square, circle, house, and something that looks like an apple or a heart. Um, and when they're presented in this format, five on a row with a bar around them for contour interaction, this is a scientific and reliable way of presenting uh, a, a, we call them optotypes or a symbol to a child to ask if they can identify it or not. So we're controlling other factors that can interfere. If we only showed them one symbol on a blank page, they'd be more likely to be able to see that and interpret that than if there are other, um, there are other details around it. So we might overestimate their vision if we present a symbol without contour interaction around it. Um, if we ask them to look at letters, other letters, like the complete alphabet, we might underestimate their vision because they don't know their letters uh, reliably yet. Or they might be hesitant to say their letters for fear of making a mistake. Um, the HOTV letters are chosen because they're non-reversible, so you don't have to worry about B and D. They're the same either way. Um, four letters and four symbols in the LEA symbols are chosen because you can also either teach the child those four symbols um, or you can give them a matching card to point to the one that you're asking them to identify. So if they don't have verbal skills, they can point. If they're too shy to talk, they can point. Um, if they don't know the letter or they don't know what to call the symbol, they can still point. Um, so um, even with um, deaf kids, the, the LEA symbols are a little hard to interpret. The letters are easier because the symbols for the letters are much easier to interpret. Um, when you get to the LEA symbols, like square is like this, and circle is often is like this, and heart is like this, and when you get a three-year-old who's doing those symbols, it's really hard to tell the difference. So we try and teach them that the heart is an apple, because that sign is much easier to differentiate. Um, but there are different ways to teach the symbols to kids because there's only four of them. <laughs> are these tools consistent across all eye 
doctors are going to get some that may not have the tools to use with children? I think you will get some that don't have the tools to use with children if they have practices that where their patient population is primarily adults. But amongst those of us who see kids, these are the standard ways of checking it, visual acuity in kids. Um, for refraction, this is measuring the prescription, um, often done after eye drops are instilled. Um, adults go through sitting behind a phoropter. Kids don't have to do that. There are ways of holding, putting the lenses in a little frame instead or just holding lenses in front of their eyes to, to achieve the same result. So they don't have to sit behind the phoropter. They don't have to be tall enough to do that. I find a lot of kids are scared of the phoropter until they're about five and then it's the most exciting thing in the world. <laughs> Um, when we test eye coordination, this is a picture of a cover test. You look at a target and then one eye at a time is covered to see if that eye is staying straight. Um, depth perception, the picture up on the left with the 3D glasses. Um, 3D vision is only achievable if both eyes are straight and looking together. This is how we assess eye health. So just different instruments that direct lights in the eyes to, to view the structures inside the eye. So. If number one, my child will tell me if he can't see well. Most kids don't know that they're not seeing properly, so they're not gonna volunteer that information. Yeah. My child's doing well in school, so she doesn't need to have an eye exam. Many kids will work extra hard and still meet the, the requirement, especially if they're very bright. They don't have to work very hard to meet the requirement but that extra effort that they're putting in takes away from the progress that they could be achieving. So, I have to wait till my child can read letters before I do an eye exam. This is the most common one I get. And no, you saw all the different tests that can be done with kids. They don't have to know their letters. They don't have to speak. Um, they do have to look. <laughs> So, so as young as six months, you can use observation or behavioral patterns to determine visual acuity in kids. Um, my child will be intimidated by instruments. Well, that's pretty true. <laughs> that's pretty true. I find especially around age two, two and a half, it's really hard for, for kids. That's probably the most difficult age to do an eye exam, especially if they've had a bad experience in another doctor's office. But, um, but it's doable, and with child-friendly tests and you know a lot of toys in the exam room, in the waiting room, um, and just a different approach. It's you know less instrumentation um, and a little slower pace to test kids, but at any age. I have a TV in my room, um, so that when I want them to look at a distance, they have a television screen to watch. So. Um, in terms of who does eye exams, optometrists and ophthalmologists provide comprehensive eye exams, um, and some family doctors and pediatricians do a partial exam or a vision screening. Um, there are some vision screenings going on in some schools, um, and opticians make and fit glasses. So, when should kids have their eyes tested? Um, at six months, six to 12 months is the best time for a first exam. Then before starting school, around age three or four, and then every 12 to 24 months, depending on what the results of their previous exams have been. So, but what percentage of kids start school without having had an eye exam? 85%. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so the last few minutes I want to tell you about the initiative that's going across, across Canada, really. Um, through optometric associations, which is to encourage and ensure that kids have a vision evaluation before they start school. And so the program's called the ICI Learn program. It's an eye health and vision awareness program. It started in, um, it, it started in Alberta uh, a few years ago. And the deal is that, um, some information about the importance of eye exams and the impact of vision problems on learning is distributed through the schools. So the optometric associations have a partnership with the schools to distribute educational materials about vision. And families are encouraged to take their child to their local optometrist for a comprehensive eye exam. 
And at that comprehensive eye exam, if a vision problem is detected and a child needs glasses, the glasses are provided free of charge. So industry sponsors are supplying glasses and frames, and optometrists are donating their time in ordering and verifying glasses and then dispensing and servicing them to ensure that kids don't have barriers to vision correction as they're starting school. So it's an initiative that uh, started, as I said, in Alberta, is now expanding into all provinces across Canada. So most provinces have a version of ICI Learn. Um, in Ontario, we have ICI Learn going on in all of these regions. And within two years, it will be expanded province-wide. So it's part of a five-year plan to develop it across the province of Ontario. This year, 2014, it will start in the Toronto region. Yeah. So, um, Information about the ICI Learn program is available through OAO or the Ontario Association of Optometrists. They have a lot of information on their icilearn.ca website. If you're not in Ontario, um, then the Canadian Association of Optometrists is your best resource to find out what's going on in your province um, and who the contact people are from there. Um, most provinces, like Ontario, that are running it will have a list of participating optometrists, and I would say overwhelmingly, like 90% of optometrists participate in the program. So it's a very, it's a very popular program to be involved with, um, and on the receiving end, a lot of schools are are very receptive of sharing that information with kids and encouraging their kids to go for comprehensive eye exams. Yeah. So from here in Ontario. Um, there, there hasn't been, um, uh, so the, Hamilton was the first region, and I'll have to say we chose Hamilton because of its size and just the logistics of bringing out a new program and not having the numbers so big that it was overwhelming. That's why it's taken us a while to get to Toronto, because the numbers are so overwhelming. It's the largest region by far. So it's mainly been... Um, interest and um, size of regions that has determined the, the sequence of what regions are involved. So, but it's getting there to the full province. You know, I don't know that they list it on their website, but if you contact the Ontario Association of Optometrists with that specific question, they certainly can make recommendations for optometrists in a specific region who are comfortable seeing children. So I'd say under the age of three, um, not every optometrist is comfortable seeing children or prepared with the materials like I've shown you to see kids. And, you know, that's okay. Um, every optometrist kind of has a different patient population. Um, you know, I see just kids in my practice, so I have all of this stuff. But um, most optometrists who's are, who have family-oriented practices will have some materials for children at that age. But, yeah, it's, it's fine to check with the OAO, and they can certainly direct you towards a, a number of optometrists interests in a specific region. Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask a question on topic? Sure. Um, the lost tear ducts, mm -hmm. a lot of babies having, yes. often going for us until a year, mm -hmm. um, and with the goofy nuts and the drawing and everything, is there an impact on the vision and or learning with these babies? No, blocked tear ducts is one condition that, although it's it's annoying on a daily basis, it doesn't have a it, it doesn't have a it's not a risk factor for a, a, a long term vision problem, and I think that's part of the conservative approach towards treating them as well. So um, so usually the approach is with antibiotic drops if if there is a lot of recurrent infection of the eye, but certainly with a lid massage to try and stimulate opening of that tear duct. Um, up until the age of about one year, yeah, so it does, yeah. Right. Yeah, and then it's a difficult decision though because the probing requires um, general sedation, and so you kind of have to weigh that: is the is the goopiness on a daily basis 
better or worse than putting my child under general sedation to do this procedure? And should I just not wait until the child is a year, sometimes even older than that? Um, and if there are any health concerns with the child, then that's another deterrent to pr like um, pursuing a procedure that requires general sedation. Yeah, as long as they're getting the education about um, doing the lid massage properly, and if they need antibiotic eye drops, then and those, I mean, the primary care physician can prescribe those, or the optometrist can prescribe those as well. So, yeah. A lot of people ask about what can they do to help their child's vision develop well. Screen time is a very common question. Um, and screen time is important, I think not just for vision though, but for general development. So a lot of the studies are showing us that attention and cognitive skills are affected by long screen times. And so, um, you know, the Association of Pediatrics sets a, a limit of two hours per day for screen time. I think though, realistically, that's for kids who are five and older. And under five, really, no screen time is what's recommended. Um, that, understandably, that's unrealistic, but that's the recommendation. Um, and if there is screen time in that sense, you know, I always tell um, families with infants, you know, not the iPhone screen, so something a little larger. The iPad screen is a more appropriate size or a regular um, desktop, you know, screen size is more appropriate for infant eyes and very short periods of time, five or ten minutes at a time. You know, it's not a sustained activity to look at things. If you're looking at some photos and such on the iPad, you know, fine, but uh, limit the time, you know, of involvement of the screen. Other things that parents can do um, are to, you know, going through the visual milestone, if we go back to that, is kind of encouraging kids in those activities. So within the first couple of months of life, it's showing them brightly colored objects, trying to get their attention, their visual attention towards it, asking them, well, not necessarily asking them, but encouraging them to look back and forth or providing targets that help um, maintain their interest so that they'll move their eyes back and forth and closer and further to stimulate convergence. And then when you get into the, you know, the two-year age range, it's introducing activities like crayons to draw and scribble and dot-to-dot -dot patterns and simple puzzles with, you know, the, you know, where the one puzzle piece fits into the cutout on the, in the wooden, um, uh, template, um, and then larger puzzles or building toys with Lego or, or um, you know, Duplo and whatever is appropriate for their age range, construction toys that have them putting pieces together and making visual discriminations. So kind of what's guided at each stage of the milestones are activities that emphasize those skills, help kids to learn to use their vision. A lot of people do think that if they put their child in glasses at a young age, that that's going to cause their eyes to weaken and make them more dependent on glasses. And vision problems have a course of development. You know, nearsightedness and farsightedness have a course of development. Whether or not you wear glasses doesn't impact on that. So generally, farsighted eye conditions can, they have the potential to get better as a child grows older. And nearsightedness, the natural history of nearsightedness is to progress throughout childhood because the eyeball is growing longer. So whether or not you wear glasses doesn't impact how the condition is going to develop or change in time. But it does impact how the vision develops at this point in time. So if the vision's not stimulated at age you know, two because a correction is not provided and the eye becomes lazy or amblyopia develops in that eye, then correcting them when they're five won't necessarily restore that vision. So.
Blackboard. Yes. Right? Um, or to see them in different groups or whatever, like small friends like that. Yes. Right? Um, should they be wearing it other times? It depends on the degree of the prescription. So um, it kind of goes by the number. So um, right. let's say they only have a minus one prescription. Generally, that means that their vision kind of beyond 10 feet or so is blurred. And then I'd say, no, you don't need to wear your glasses all the time. Once their prescription is minus 250 or minus three, which would mean that their clear zone is only up to about 30 or 40 centimeters, then they definitely should wear their glasses full time. Yeah, the would make that clear, yes, right? yes. Okay. Some people don't necessarily follow that instruction. <laughs> right. right. Any other questions? No? One other slide I'll show you. If you do have questions um, about children's vision in general, so if you have questions about ICI Learn, please contact OAO because they're the experts in that and they have all the specific details and resources to share with you. But if you have questions about children's vision, feel free to contact me anytime. I'm happy to answer any questions.